Let's pray together. Father, indeed, you have chosen, among many things, to use your word to reveal your glory. And Father, it is indeed the glorious nature of your being that we need to see. It is that vision that stirs within our heart the right responses that we should have toward you. And so, Lord, we do pray that in this time as we look together to your word, that, Father, we would be given eyes to see it correctly. And, Lord, that we would be given hearts and that are willing to embrace its truth. Father, help us to be good listeners and to good, be, do good, be good doers of your word. So, Father, may your spirit be active mightily in our midst as we humble ourselves before your word. It's in Christ's name that we pray. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but there are many things that you can do with a mountain. You can climb the mountain. You can take a picture of the mountain from the base, or you can climb up that mountain and take a picture of the, the view of the valley below that the mountain gives you. You can slide down the mountain if there's snow on it. You can mine the mountain for minerals and precious jewels. If you have the right gear, you can even jump off the mountain if you're that thrill seeker, that much of a thrill seeker. But you can also get up early in the morning, and find your way out to the, a good vista of the mountain and watch the sun rise. And as the sun begins to hit upon the different shapes of that mountain, creating shadows and providing different lights, that you would not see in the middle of the day, you can simply admire the mountain, behold its beauty. And a lot of times that is true of the Lord Jesus. There are many things that we can do in relationship to Christ. We can serve Christ. We can worship Christ. We can think of all the, the things that, from an activity thing that we can do, or all the things that we should do. And maybe that's where you're at this morning. That as you sit here, there are 13 different things on your mind that you need to change about yourself. Or you need to repent over in order to conform more to what Christ expects of you. Or an agenda list of activities that you need to do in service to Christ. Make no mistake, there is a place for us to serve Christ. There is a place for us to be concerned about the shortcomings of our life that we need to repent of and we need to conform better to the pattern of the Lord Jesus. All those things are things that we should be doing. But they're not the greatest thing. And sometimes, just like with the mountain, we can get so consumed with what we can do for and with the mountain, we actually fail to just stop back and to enjoy the mountain. That it's there. And with the Lord Jesus, we can often get so focused on all the things that we need to do, we miss the greatest thing we need to do, which is to trust Jesus. Sola fide, faith alone, is one of those truths that in the Protestant Reformation was sort of recovered or rediscovered. That it's faith alone in Christ. That's the response that we are to give to the glorious nature and work of the Lord Jesus Christ that we proclaim in the gospel. And this particular idea of faith alone is found in the story here that Dwight just read for us in Matthew chapter 15. And really this whole second half of chapter 15 puts into practice the message of the first half of the chapter that we looked at last week. In that passage, Jesus relaxed this Jewish purity culture that up to this point had kept Jew and Gentile apart. See, the Pharisees said, well, if you, don't, if you eat with unwashed hands, you're going to ceremonially defile yourself. 
And Jesus rejects that teaching. And one of those concerns of purity did not just extend to the food they ate, but the Jews would also say there are certain types of people that you don't engage with because if you engage with those people, you're going to make yourself spiritually impure. And so Jesus moves from dealing with this idea of eating with unwashed hands to dealing with interactions with people that were considered spiritually impure by the Jewish nation. And so let's look at this story here very quickly, and then we want to look at how and what it teaches us about faith. There in verse 21, Jesus went from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. So he's leaving the nation of Israel. And as he leaves the nation of Israel, a verse 22, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Now, it's not by accident that Matthew uses the word and phrase there, Canaanite, to describe this lady. Now, this lady was not technically a Canaanite. She was a Phoenician woman. And so it would be sort of like us today telling someone who is German, calling them a Prussian, right? There's no Prussians anymore because there's no Prussia. Germany has taken its place. And that's really what's happening here. This woman isn't a Canaanite, she is a Phoenician. She is a Gentile, she's a non-Jewish woman. But it's not by accident that Matthew picks that term because Canaanite was part of the traditional biblical vocabulary for the most persistent and insidious of Israel's enemies in the Old Testament. If you remember back to when we were studying the book of Judges, it was the Canaanites that were typically this reoccurring enemy, and they were a danger. As a matter of fact, God called the Israelites to drive them out of the land that he had given them as an inheritance because their presence and their idolatrous religion would be a constant threat to the purity of true worship of Yahweh. And so Matthew is setting the scene here saying, look, here is this pagan, spiritually impure woman who approaches Jesus, asking him to have mercy on her because her daughter is possessed of a demon. And what's interesting as well is that Matthew not only identifies how she is associated with sworn enemies to the Jewish people, and to Yahweh, but in her words, this enemy, we don't hear her cursing the Messiah. We instead hear her calling Jesus both Kyrios, Lord, and Son of David, indicating a remarkable respect that's bordering on worship. And Matthew's setting a foil here, comparing this Canaanite woman who would have been viewed as a very low on the social status scale, right? In her words, she's recognizing Jesus as someone of great authority. Compared to how the Pharisees, the religious leaders in Jesus' day, treat Jesus, which is rejection and entrapment. Matthew's setting this up. He goes on to tell the story there that as she cries out in verse 23, Jesus did not answer her a word. He ignores her. And his disciples came and begged him saying, send her away for she is crying out over us. Right? Everywhere they went, when they went to High V, there she was in the aisle. Hey, I've got this problem. Will you help me? When they go down to Smoky Row to get some coffee, she's banging on the window. Hey, my daughter's got a problem. Will you have mercy on me? Will you help me? And so the disciples are getting annoyed at this. And so the disciples say, Jesus, can you, can you just help her so she'll go away and leave us alone? And in response to this request, verse 24, Jesus answered, I was sent only... To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And Jesus is saying, look, my mission begins with the nation of Israel. Now up to this point, Jesus has done a few things for some Gentiles. Back in chapter 8, chapter 10, he references it a little bit about a later mission to the Gentiles once he has left the disciples. And Jesus had healed the centurion servant from a distance back in Matthew chapter 8. But here he's making it clear, listen, we've withdrawn from 
Jerusalem and from the nation of Israel so we can get some rest and get away from this plotting and scheming that these Jewish leaders are trying against me. And now in the midst of this rest, this obnoxious woman is here begging for mercy. And Jesus is saying, look, that's not, that's not the timetable that I currently have. And so then in verse 26 or verse 25, she came again and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread, referring to Israel, and throw it to the dogs, referring to Gentiles. And again, this is nothing new. Earlier in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, Jesus gives this warning, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. So a lot of times we can hear this statement and sense some harshness in it, but Jesus is saying, look, he's following his own teacher. Here is this Canaanite woman, and he's saying, look, I'm not going to give to dogs what is holy. And it's interesting that the children, as Jesus in his illustration here, the children are in position of right and privilege. They have a right to their father's table. And the dogs cannot hope to share what belongs to the children. And so therefore what is holy is not given to dogs. This is the reasoning that Jesus is doing. He's not saying that's forever, but for the time being that is his mission. But again, notice the persistence of the woman, verse 27. She said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. In her mind, she's saying if Gentiles, if non-Jewish people are to be dogs, then at least let the dogs have their due. The dogs do have a right to be fed, even if what they get is leftovers from their children's table. And so this Canaanite woman, this non-Jewish woman, recognizes that Jesus as the Messiah of Israel must indeed first go to his own people. But that does not mean that his mission must stop there. Her reply, most likely she did not realize this, but it encapsulated and summarizes this important biblical theological idea of the election of Israel. That Israel was chosen by God not just for their benefit alone, but God chose them as a nation And that he would bless them so that they in turn could be a blessing and a light to the Gentile nations. Something that they did not embrace, but nonetheless that was why God chose them. And it's interesting that too in her response, that while the Pharisees and the scribes all tried to trap Jesus, this lady sort of gets the better of it. I believe that Jesus is ultimately setting this scenario up to teach his disciples this lesson that just like you're not defiled by eating with unwashed hands, we are not defiled by taking the gospel and the blessings of what Jesus accomplished to those who are outside of the nation of Israel, which if you read the book of Acts is something that the early church struggled to embrace. But this lady in her response is basically, as one person put it, she calls it her master's table. Right? If she were a dog, she was his dog. And it cannot be ill of us if we stand but in the lowest relationship to Christ. I may not be a child, but at least I'm your dog. And I would rather be your dog at your table eating the leftovers. Because you are the true Lord and you are tr- the true Messiah sent from God. This is later confirmed elsewhere that Jesus must first go to Israel in fulfillment of the promises made to the nation of Israel. And the goal was that by doing that, the Gentiles themselves would ultimately glorify God for the promises he made to his people. Romans 15, verses 8 and 9, Apostle Paul states this. He says, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised, which was the sign of the Jews, circumcision, He became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. He had to do it that way. And in order, 
that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. So Paul is even echoing here what Jesus stated earlier in his earthly ministry. So in the first half of this chapter, as we saw last week, Jesus broke decisively with a whole section of Hebrew Scripture, this holiness code of what is clean and unclean, and he broke with that section in in the interest of keeping the main point of the Hebrew Scripture, the importance of people and the Ten Commandments. Now, in this sort of third quarter of the chapter, Jesus breaks just as decisively with a prior tribalism in the old tradition that the non-Jewish people are spiritually unclean and if you engage and interact with them, you will corrupt yourselves. That's how they would have thought in Jesus' day and Jesus is breaking that by showing mercy to this Canaanite woman. Verse 28, Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. There's only one other time in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus praises the faith of someone else. Most of the time with his disciples, he's saying, Oh, you have little faith. But here, she, he con- congratulates her on this faith. You have a great faith. And the other time was back in Matthew 8, again dealing with a Gentile Roman soldier, someone who would have been viewed as an enemy of the people of Israel. And he says, there is no one of your faith in all of Israel. He's holding this up. And he is opening himself up to a, the whole world in his mission. I think ultimately this encounter, this story of the Canaanite woman teaches us that great faith or true faith persists in relying on Christ, not our experience. You see, experience would tell the disciples and to us that you will not find faith outside of the nation of Israel. If you go to Tyre and Sidon, you're not going to find someone who's going to trust in the Jewish Messiah. But her story teaches us that we find faith in unlikely faces. It is grace, as one someone said, not place, which makes people believers. And her story shows that anyone can come to Jesus and find mercy there because Jesus is a merciful and compassionate Savior. He will comfort the troubled, the needy, even the desperate if they will just trust that he will do so. So as we think about this idea that great or true faith persists in relying on Christ, depending on Christ, not on their experience, we find in this story really two characteristics of true and great faith. First of all, we see that true faith is persistent. True faith is persistent. You see, it's not discouraged when it it, it experiences silence from Jesus. Notice what happens here. The woman comes and she says there in verse 22, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. Then later on there in verse 25, but she came again and knelt before him saying, Lord, help me, persistence. And he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. You see, she's not turned off by his silence and also by this sort of enigma statement that Jesus gives. What do you mean by that? Right? She grasped at what he did not say and what he did say. He did not say, go away. He did not say, no, I will not help you. Faith is holding on to Jesus for dear life, like a drowning person holding on to a life raft, believing that Jesus is good even when his words don't seem to be good or his lack of words. He's not responding, well, I trust him. 
He's given me a reply that I don't fully understand what that means. Will I be discouraged and walk away? Or will I persist in knowing that Jesus is good and he's worthy of my trust? You see, faith, to use the vernacular, is hanging in there. It is believing that Jesus will deliver, deliver, and a great faith is faith that overcomes the biggest discouragement of all, the discouragement that can often come from Jesus' own words when he tells us something we don't want to hear or when he doesn't respond at all. Faith is refusing to believe the Lord can be bad to faith in him. But faith is not just avoids being discouraged when they experience silence from Jesus. Great faith is persistent. It is not discouraged when experiencing unfriendliness from Jesus' disciples. Notice what happens here. When she comes and says, Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely oppressed. Will you have mercy on me? And she doesn't answer. Jesus doesn't reply. The disciples get annoyed. Right, And they're like, look, help her not because we care about her. They're not friendly towards this lady. She's an annoyance to them. And they just say, well, you just deal with this problem. I'm sure she could see that annoyance, right? They had ways of, of expressing that through body language. And so sometimes a discouragement can come in the face of hostile disciples. As we all well know, the church can turn people away just as well as it can attract them. But you see, great faith refuses to let even the church or Jesus' disciples be the last word. Their faith is not in his disciples. Their faith is in Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning in that way. So much of your faith has been rocked because you've been trusting in men and women. Your faith has been in humans alone, not in Christ. And so rightfully so, you have been disappointed and you will continue to be disappointed if your faith is in Christ's disciples rather than in Christ. But you see, true and great faith is persistent because it doesn't get discouraged when it experiences this unfriendliness from Jesus' disciples. Occasionally, this unfriendliness is expressed in indifference, sort of like where these disciples are. They're not as concerned about this woman as they should be. And maybe that's been your experience. You've been disappointed that the church hasn't cared for you or loved you at the level and expectation that you have. Your expectations could have been wrong, or you may be right. The church should have done X and Y, and they have failed. But your faith ultimately should not be in Christ's disciples. And so when you're shown indifference as a form of unfriendliness, it does not cause you to hit the mat in giving up in trusting in Christ. And occasionally this unfriendliness can be expressed in outright hostility, opposition. And of course, that's not something we encourage. We, as disciples, should not be trying to do that. But faith that lets itself be discouraged by disciples is weak faith. In those moments, we're not OU of great faith. We're of OU of little faith. Because disciples are, after all, human beings like everyone else. It doesn't excuse their failure to do what they should do. It is just recognizing reality faith in jesus is not faith in jesus disciples because christians are not christ they are simply trying to follow them the first characteristic we've noticed here is that true faith is persistent it's demonstrated by this canaanite woman's unwillingness to stop pursuing reliance on Jesus, even when Jesus is silent towards her, even when Jesus sort of gives these odd statements, but he's not saying no. He's not saying go away. So I'm going to persist in trusting that he has the power and the goodness to do the good I need done in my life. And she is persistent in face of the opportunity to be discouraged by the unfriendliness of Jesus' disciples. But she persists. 
And if we want to be people of true and great faith, we must have that same persistence. That of all the things we can do with Jesus, we can't miss the greatest one, which is to rely on him for everything. The second characteristic in this story about true faith is that true faith is productive. True faith is productive. You see, relying on Christ produces cleansing power. Last week as I was preaching this sermon on verses 1 through 20, I sort of felt bad sort of leaving us where we did, but I did it not for theatrical purposes, but to make a stronger point this Sunday. If you'll remember, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and he says, look, it's not, it's not what you eat and eating with dirty hands that defiles you. What defiles you is what comes out of your evil heart. And he listed all of those things back there in verse 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder and adultery and sexual immorality, theft and false witness and slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone it's like okay well thanks jesus that's good to know but what do we do about the evil heart that is defiling us you you've relieved our conscience that if we eat with unwashed hands we won't be spiritually impure before the lord but we have this evil heart what's going to cleanse that and i believe matthew here is saying persistent faith in jesus When we trust in Christ, he alone changes the evil heart into a new heart. So that out of that heart no longer come those old defiling things that used to dominate our life. We're seeing a change in who we are because God has changed us at our very core being. And how did that change come about? Not by having the right lineage of being of the Jewish descent, but simply by great faith, relying on Christ. See, as we move deep into Matthew's structure of how he's ordered his gospel, we see that the story in chapter 15 culminated in this convicting ministry of the law to us, showing our problematic hearts and convincing us of our need of salvation. So in this second story, it ministers the encouraging gospel to us, showing how the gospel, Christ's death and resurrection, can be of benefit to us, a way of salvation. The vicious thoughts of the heart defile the persons in verses 1 through 20, and faith cleanses the heart in verses 21 through 28. And so this present faith story can be heard as an answer to the question posed by the preceding story, a person's heart is cleansed, by faith in Jesus. And to show you that I'm not overreading this story, I want to sh- I want to read f- uh, just a short passage from the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small discussion and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. So the crumbs have found them, right? And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and in order them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, right, knows that there's faith there. That's his, in, that's his point there. He knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. 
Peter's point is, he didn't cleanse them by circumcision and by the keeping of the law of Moses. He didn't cleanse them by making sure they washed their hands before they ate their food. He didn't wash them because they were Jewish. He cleansed their heart by faith. They heard the good news of what Jesus had done in his life, his death, and his resurrection, and they believed it. And because they believed, that evil heart that puts out all these things that defile us was cleansed and made a new heart. True faith in Christ, true reliance on Christ, always produces a cleansing power. But relying on Christ also produces a communal power. A communal power. You see, the exciting thing about faith is how communal it is. Where we bring other people before Jesus with confidence that he can help. He does. Notice this Canaanite woman does not approach Jesus for her own sake. She has faith that God would work in the life of someone very dear to her. Her own daughter. And the reality is everyone in this room has people like that in our life. It might be a spouse. It might be a grandparent, a parent, a child, a grandchild a brother or sister, a best friend. We all have people who need the help of Christ in some way or fashion. And it may take time. The silence of Jesus may intervene for a period. Difficult to understand words and experience regarding this person may occur. And sometimes those difficult words and experiences may come by the hands of disciples of Jesus himself. But in the end, we can entrust these people to Christ. We can ask him, we can persistently plead that God would do the only work he can do to change their heart. We know we can't change it. We know they can't change their heart. And so we bring them to the only one who can. And we ask that God would use us pursuing him on their behalf to intervene. And to do so, we must be convinced that faith is confident that Jesus is good. And that goodness is activated on our behalf, not when we prove how good we are. But it is activated when we trust. We rely solely upon Christ. That type of faith is inevitably For the just shall live by faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this reminder that in all of the things that we can and should do for you, we can never move beyond trusting, relying upon. Lord, it is, it is you, our trust in you, that has cleansed our hearts. It is trusting in you that brings help to those that we bring before you. And so, Father, we pray that we would never be a people that move beyond this simple truth that great faith is not us accomplishing great things for you. Great faith is demonstrated when we rely upon you for everything. Lord, reliance on anything else is foolishness. Nothing and no one can come close to how trustworthy you are. And so, Father, I pray that when we are tempted to be discouraged in our faith because of our experiences with you and with how you're bringing about things in our lives, and we're tempted to be discouraged because of the experiences with other Christians who have let us down. 
that you would help us to turn our eyes from our experiences and turn our eyes from our experiences with other people that we would look in faith upon you and know that you never do faith bad. We'll never ultimately be able to look back from the vantage point of heaven and say, I messed up when I trust Christ in that moment. I should have trusted my gut. I should have trusted the words of someone else. We will not do that. But we will look back with foolishness at these moments where we did not trust and rely upon you. And so, Father, we pray that in this room of people filled with little faith, that you would give us a measure of great faith to rely upon you for all of life. It's in Christ's name that we pray. This time I invite you to stand.